Hi, my name is Michelle Spray. I'm a digital reporter with Contemporary OBGYN, and I'm talking about Google Glass with Dr. Brian Levine and John Nasta. If you guys would like to go ahead and introduce yourselves. Brian, you want to go first? Sure. Um, thank you. So my name is Dr. Brian Levine, and as you know, I'm a practicing OBGYN currently at New York Hospital, also known as Cornell Medical Center. And besides the fact that I am currently in my fellowship for reproductive endocrinology and infertility, I have a huge penchant for technology. So I've been very excited to be one of the Google Glass explorers, and I've been looking at ways to integrate Google Glass into my daily workflow here at the hospital, and also figure out new innovative ways to use Google Glass in healthcare. Hello, everyone. My name is John Nasta. My background actually is in cardiovascular physiology, so I have similar clinical roots. But uh, much to the dismay of my parents, I left medical school to follow my interest in communication and translating technical issues to physicians and patients. Um, I've been studying technology for about 20 years, and about a year ago, I jumped onto the Google Glass bandwagon and uh, have been studying the application of technology to uh, the practice of medicine, both from a perspective of clinicians as well as patients. Okay, great. Um, can each of you tell me how long you've been using Google Glass and what ways you've been using it? Uh, sure. So uh, I'll start. I started using Google Glass about six weeks ago when I got this crazy email from Google saying I've been invited um, to join the Explorer program. I don't know how I got in. I don't know what went through to get the invitation, but I knew that once the invitation came, I jumped on the opportunity uh, to get Google Glass. Since since setting up my Google Glass and since using it, um, I've been trying to integrate it every way possible. So I've been using it quite often for a lot of the simple features. Um, I haven't used any of the advanced hack programs or anything. I'm using just kind of one comes out of the box or what's available with the Google Glassware. But in general, I've been using Google Glass um, kind of for lifestyle stuff. So going around, using the maps, using the other applications, for example. And every so often, I'm exploring the opportunity to use the Google Hangouts or the live video feed to figure out a way that that could help augment or improve the current medical education system that we have right now. I have been wearing Google Glass now for about, I think it's fair to say, uh, seven or eight months. I was one of the earliest Google Explorers. And I have to say that my initial experience with Google was rather disappointing. So for the past five months or so, six months, I've been using them intermittently, large because I, largely because I wear glasses. And I found that this imposition of glass over my existing glasses was quite difficult. So recently I have had prescription lenses, and I've taken the journey of total immersion with glass. I put them on in the morning when I get out of bed, and I carry them with me all day. I have a hotspot on my phone, so I use them in about every aspect of my life, which has been a bit of a blessing and a curse. Um, it's a little bit difficult to hear sometimes, some of the, the navigation modalities or the user experience are lackluster, but it's been, I would say, about two months for me really emerging into or moving into, into my life with Google Glass. Okay. How, how do you think Google Glass has been affecting the medical community, and how do you think it can help shape healthcare in the future? Um, so maybe I'll start from, from the doctor side, and John can maybe mm -hmm. hop in from the, because he follows all the tech world stuff, so he could probably mm -hmm. follow in from the, like the big picture stuff. You know, I have to say that as a doctor, um, we're very custom traditions. Uh, I, I think you, you've noticed that I typically don't wear a tie, although that's currently a tradition for most doctors, um, but I do don the white coat, and this is almost synonymous with, with healthcare and going to visit the doctor. The reason I mention these, these two things is that Google Glass is another thing that stands out there. And I think that for some patients, it signifies something that they're uncomfortable with. The big question is patient privacy, for example. So one of the things in healthcare is as I walk around Google Glass, maybe in my office or the hospital, I get lots of questions. And the number one question is, is the camera on? Um, people want to know, what am I reporting? How am I reporting? And how do I know if I'm being recorded? So one of the first things about Google Glass in healthcare is how Google Glass is perceived by those who are consumers of healthcare or people participating in the healthcare system. Um, from a doctor's perspective, I could see it working well in a hospital, working well in a practice. But as John said, his limitation initially was not having prescription lenses. 
I think the form factor itself might also be a limitation in its current incarnation right now. So, so here's the big question, okay? Brian said that the first question a patient asks is, are those glasses on? I think what he was implying was those glasses better be off because I think people feel there's this level of intrusion. I would argue that the future will be those glasses better be on because augmenting clinical practice, pulling in IBM Watson, Dr. Watson, into a live stream, streaming in, into, in engagement using natural language is going to change these things dramatically. So I, I'll take the question from the other side of the spectrum, from maybe the early adopter or the innovator where, where regulatory constraints are perhaps a little bit loosened versus the, the, the typical clinical practice. But, but I see in medicine right now Google Glass as a vehicle that is empty. I see it as an iPhone or a smartphone without apps. What I think will emerge are brilliant applications, many of which we haven't even thought of yet because Google Glass is a beta. We haven't applied our clinical wisdom. We haven't applied the, the sense of urgency when a patient codes or when a heart rate drops. Those sort of clinical scenarios overlaid onto a technological environment, I think, are going to, to, to raise that specter a little bit. So I tend to be a little bit more optimistic. I personally have seen a variety of interesting scenarios. For example, a cath lab where a procedure was being done to close a, uh, a, a septal defect in the heart. And the physician who pioneered the procedure was not in the room but was watching the procedure on glass or was watching it on a monitor while the, while the interventional cardiologist wore glass. And he noticed something was wrong. He noticed that there was a suspicious shadow uh, on the monitor and suspected that it was a clot. They withdrew the catheter and they actually found a large blood clot in place. So those kind of things are going to become very, very interesting. I think that at that level, at the level of the specialist, at the level of the intervention, laparoscopic procedures, things like that, Google Glass may find an earlier, earlier level of engagement outside of, let's say, the traditional practice environment where you're going in and seeing a patient. Now, that being said, I think the greatest strength of Google Glass may be in its use in interpreting natural language, the history, and the physical. So it may come full circle and actually become a mundane tool for that office exam. You know, it's interesting, John. The, um, I, I was, I'm a huge fan right now of Google Plus because I think that my Google Plus experience is actually dominated by a lot of geeky people like me that are Google Glass oriented. So I, I see a lot of great conversations and I, I was reading this story yesterday about people wondering if Google Glass can be used for those who are hard of hearing. So for a physician who can no longer take a history, maybe there's some way Google Glass could actually, actually interpret what's being said and yeah. put the words across the screen. Sure. Forget for translation to another language, literally just giving a graphical display of text. Yep. Helping you better communicate with your patient. I know that's we're, we're amazing. I know we're we're going off 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 track already, but I think that that's the nature of this innovation. What Google Glass is is a catalyst to change. Is a spark of innovation that's going to make us think in new directions. Look at Google Glass coming out with the Google Contact Lens, right? <laughs> that measures the blood glucose level in the tear film. Now, even today, I read about a contact lens that has a Braille characteristic that directly transmit braille signals to a blind person using the eye as a tactile interface for braille. So again, the kind of things that, that will emerge probably will be unexpected and, and come from places we don't already know. Uh, the other thing, and Brian, I agree with you 100%, I think the innovation of glass in clinical practice will come from smart people outside of clinical practice. People who are technicians who who understand devices, technology, things like that, who will speak with physicians, who will engage and cross-pollinate. And, and that's the magic of digital health as we go more broadly, where multiple voices will become empowered to, to shape ideas from, from a multifactorial perspective. You know, it, it's interesting. Is um, A lot of people think of doctors as practitioners. We're practicing our art of medicine. Well, what people forget about doctors is actually before you actually practice, you're a consumer of healthcare education. And so you actually take a very interesting role, which is you go from consumer to trainee to provider. 
And as you think about these very powerful transitions that people make entering medical school, graduating medical school, entering residency, where they're called doctor, leaving residency, where now they're a professional, I see Google Glass being part of that transition process. I mean, think about how amazing it would be to be in medical school and to be able to sit there and lecture to have a Google Glass that could help you augment your studying. You know, you know, to have some sort of study materials or whatnot. To then take glass from studying for the boards to the wards. All that material that you amassed for these, these magical exams that really don't mean anything but everyone studies for, now you go back to your study resources that have them at your fingertips in front of your eye. To then go to practice where you can take the tools that you use to amass in your education and now implement that stuff. And that's, yeah, where, I see, mm -hmm. that's where I see Google Glass is helping you transition through these very tough transition points that no one really acknowledges how hard they are. So Brian, if you're if you're on rounds and, and, and the chief of the service comes in on rounds and he asks you for a differential diagnosis for a patient with abdominal pain and you pull out your smartphone, you'll probably be, be in trouble a little bit there because the 65-year-old guy who went through traditional medical school doesn't like it. That's cheating, you know? Imagine looking into your Google Glass and coming up with a differential that's mediated by by a, a, a brilliant algorithm that comes out of IBM. It's going to be interesting times. So I think what, what, at least for me as a practitioner, the big takeaway idea or the big message for me is at least it's the consumers of healthcare, healthcare education, that are going to push this technology. The medical students, the, the dental students, the nursing students are going to want to have better educational resources at their fingertips because the length of training is short and the length of practice is long and they want to be able to take these tools with them as they go through their different phases of their practice. I, I agree. I think that we've heard a lot about the discussion of this thing called the democratization of health with the emergence of digital health and patients taking control not only of their health but of their data, the quantified self, things like this. So I think that as patients become empowered you'll also find that being pushed from that direction also. So it becomes more of a, of, of a continuum of care where technology is going to play a larger and larger role. So John, I have a question for you, which is you and I are beta testers. We're essentially paying to try something right. out because we wanted to try something new and something different. Do you think that there's a market for applications that actually cost money? Like, do you think that we're at the point already today with Glass that people would pay for an application? Or do you think that we're not there yet and they need to be developed for free on the open market? And the reason I ask is, if we're going to ultimately expect medical students or residents or whoever to pay for these devices, what is that, that sweet spot where it starts to get too expensive to consider this part of education? That's, that's a very interesting question, and there's a lot of ways of going at that. Um, I think that that a lot of applications will be underwritten by manufacturers that have ulterior motives. Um, the way we see so many commercial enterprises now where um, this app is brought to you by Aetna or this app is brought to you by uh, contemporary OBGYN. That is, that's part of the yin and yang, the back and forth to the commercialization of products. So I think that there is a tremendous opportunity um, you'll, right now I know that you can go shopping on Glass. There's an application being developed where you can shop online or you can do a list of things you need. There are a lot of interesting applications where people use these in athletic endeavors. For example, if you go running, you can now run against yourself because all your, uh, all your data is being tracked so you can actually take yourself 10% ahead of pace or something. Right. And to me, I think that you're going to see a lot of wonderful applications in things like rehabilitation, in patient education, where patients become their own control. So you can really kind of standardize it. So I think that there are opportunities for commercial development based on the fundamental finances, because I think people can make money. And I think there's another application where people will fund it because they have the opportunity to get eyeballs of patients and doctors. So, you know, I think it's, a, it's a two opportunities. Um, Apple is stepping into digital health now. Um, Google is moving into digital health now, so I don't think the money will be the problem. I think the application and engagement 
will be the problem because these guys are tough. They're not right. easy. The user experience is, is quite difficult. And you know, it's one thing if you're a 30-year-old athlete who really loves the device, but if you're a 60-year-old hypertensive man with diabetes sitting on the couch watching TV, I don't know if you're going to be compelled to put these guys on and, and engage them the way they properly can be. It's going to be a challenge. It's going to be very interesting. And again, this is going to change uh, to models that are probably more engaging and use a higher reliance on natural language. Wow. I think that's a, it's a loaded yet exciting yeah. answer. I think you know, this is really interesting for all of us, these discussions, because it's so disruptive and it's so challenging to really kind of put these on and integrate it as you said you're doing. And at least there's so many cool conversations. And next time we get a time to chat, I'm really looking forward to talking to you about EHRs, both from the user perspective of someone who uses and, consume it and consumes electronic health records, and someone like yourself with such great experience with electronic health records. I think, Brian, that our debate will be challenged by two things on, on, on the health record. And that is the legal complications and HIPAA will will swat down any good idea because we'll be we'll, the forced you know the forced perspective of compliance is a real problem then there's the opportunity for implementing the electronic health record in practice um, and sometimes those things are um, they don't they don't really work together and they often compromise <laughs> the discussion so it's going to be very interesting yeah I look forward to our chat excellent me too